Greetings this morning and welcome this place of worship on this glorious Lord's Day morning. I invite you to stand and receive the call to worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me, and I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? I'm going to skip down. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. And the psalmist concludes, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants. None of those who trust in him, can you finish it, shall be condemned. None of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we gather this morning not because we come here seeking something earthly, seeking something that can be provided through this present age that's passing away. We come here this morning that we might be lifted up by the Holy Spirit and brought before the very presence of heaven's throne room, that we might meet with you that we might receive from you what we stand in need of, that we might receive from you food, clothing, cleansing, that we in Christ recognize that we are perfected even as we struggle in this life with our sin, with afflictions, with discouragement, Put heaven in our hearts this morning, reorientate us, Lord, that we might have our eyes fixed upon eternity, fixed upon Jesus Christ, fixed upon the inheritance that we have, the life, the resources, the inheritance we have in Christ. Press all this upon our hearts that we might be sanctified by the truth, by the Spirit, that we might worship you in spirit and truth, as we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Receive God's greeting, grace, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us turn in our hymnals to page 29b as we worship together. Now unto Jehovah, ye sons of the mighty.
In case you're wondering what I'm doing, I've got like three or four different readings of the law running through my head this morning. So I was having a really hard time which direction I wanted to go. Sometimes I change plans in the moment. But I'm reading this morning a couple verses from Thessalonica. I know some of you are studying the book of Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. And I'm going to try to integrate a little bit with that, with my reading of the law this morning. I'm reading here from Acts chapter 17. And I'm reading about Paul's experience with the Thessalonians in Thessalonica. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace. Now think about that. The Jews, the most religious people in the town, intentionally go out and look for the most evil people they can find in the marketplace. That's the alliance. That's what's going on here. But the Jews who were not persuaded, not persuaded of what? That Christ is the Messiah. Becoming envious took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here. Jason has harbored them, which was true. He housed them. And these they are calling, contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Now listen to this. This is verse 11. These were more fair-minded. This is now Berea. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Two very different responses. Now listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by the word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who exposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with his breath, with the breath of his mouth, and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all the power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among them who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie, that they may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Isn't it interesting that this last age, this last, in the last days, we see an example of this regarding Paul's experience in, with the Thessalonian church in that context. And we see this on display and described to us. Fast forward 2,000 years, now we see it on display almost on a global level almost on a global level, the great falling away 
the great falling away, the deception, the deception. When I read this, I think of what John writes in the book of Revelation regarding when Satan has been cast from heaven, recognizing he's been defeated by the death and resurrection of Christ. And he is, his plan is to sweep God's people away with the river of deception. A river of deception. How do you respond to this? How do you respond to this? Do you become fearful? Do you become anxious? Do you feel like it's out of control? Where is God in the midst of all this? Well, the Lord has told us this is what it's going to be like. This is what it's going to be like. Expect this. God is ordained. This is the way history will unfold. I had a father call me this last week. He was concerned about one of his children and the church they attend because everything is Doug Wilson and families have actually moved and relocated to Moscow, Idaho. Is that the response? Is that where you find comfort? Move to Moscow? Go sit under the ministry of a post-millennialist who teaches you that we're going to bring about the Christian kingdom through politics and our activity and our engagement? How do you reconcile that with the scriptures, honestly? How do you reconcile that with what the Bible teaches? Your anchor is Jesus Christ. The fundamentals. Do you know them? Have you hid them in your heart? Where do you go in the midst of the storm? Where do you go? Do you run off to some esteemed teacher who's heretical? Where do you go? Do you bury yourself in the truth? Immerse yourself in the truth? Anchored in the truth that never changes, is eternal, will never pass away. That's the theme of my sermon this morning. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is basically an introduction. Segways with my sermon. In the midst of the great falling away, the Lord would not have you live in fear. But he would have you be intentional. He would have you be mindful. He would have you be thoughtful. He would have you immerse yourself and wash yourself and strengthen yourself with the armor of God. It begins by girding yourself up in the truth. How'd you do this last week? What occupied your attention? What occupied your mind? How much of your attention was arming yourself with the truth? The armor of God. Are you just living, going through the motions? Going through the motions. Hoping it all turn out good. The Lord calls upon us to love him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength. That's more than just getting up on Monday morning and going to work. True, it includes the mundane things, doing all these things faithfully under the glory of the Lord. But when you love somebody, you're intentional about it. When you were dating your wife before she was your wife, you studied that woman. You were consumed with that woman. You knew what her favorite color was. You knew what flowers she liked. You studied her because you loved her. Do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? None of us love the Lord like we should, myself included. I'd be the first one to admit it. Let us confess our sin. Let us confess that we do not love the Lord with all our strength, our heart, our mind. We do, do we? We don't love our neighbors as ourselves. We, we get distracted. And sometimes we live in fear. 
You know, when you're living in fear, you're certainly not living in faith. The two are complete opposite. It's like oil and water. When you live in faith, you're anchored in the truth. You're looking at Christ, and in Christ you find, you know that he's faithful. You know that he provides you what you stand in need of. He brings security. He's a refuge. He's a rock. Let us pray. Father in heaven, help us this morning as we examine ourselves in preparation for coming to the Lord's table. May we recognize, Lord, that we are not as intentional as we should in the way that we love you and even the way we love in our homes and our families. Lord, we continue to struggle with doubt, with sin, with unbelief, with a lack of intentionality in terms of loving the Lord. And the application of this is far-reaching, probably much more far-reaching than any of us realize, myself included. Forgive us even when we are too foolish and dull to recognize we are in need of forgiveness. Lord, may we have some understanding of our sin. May we see our sin as you see it. May we see our lack of love, our lack of faith, lack of confidence. Lord, help us to see where, in fact, our sins, our, our hearts, excuse me, deceive us. Help us to see our sin and help us, Lord, that we might confess it and hate it and turn from it. Deliver us from the deception of sin, the bondage of sin, that we might walk by faith. Clearness of sight. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand to receive the decoration of pardon this morning. The triune God declares to you that as far as the east is from the west, so far does the Lord remove your sins, your transgressions from you. He assures you that those who fear the Lord, he looks upon them as a father who pities his children. He lavishes his grace upon you. You're an object of his affection, his favor. Trust him. Trust him. Find refuge in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's salvation for sinners. But is it God's salvation for you? The Lord is my shepherd. I quote that to my mother every night when I put her to bed. And I have her say, Jesus is my shepherd. And you know what? It calms her down. I notice she sleeps better. If I do that versus if I don't do that and I say a prayer with her, she sleeps better. I can watch her physically affected by Jesus is my shepherd. How about you? You don't have dementia, I trust. But someday you might. Let us respond by singing the doxology. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you by minister the word to us this morning from this pulpit, faithfully, cogently, lucidly, effectively, under the power and unction of the Holy Spirit. Lord, may you tear down what needs to be torn down, and may you strengthen and build up and renew us in the image of Jesus Christ. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 through 14. Please give your attention to the reading of God's word. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith 
follow, considering the outcome of their contact, their conduct. Excuse me. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with food which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And thus concludes the reading of God's word. Sometimes I must confess I am taken back by how fast our world changes today and is changing and has changed. When I think back to the 1970s and the early 80s when I was in high school, it's just so incredibly different today. It's really not that long of a period of time Typically, history moves pretty slow in terms of dramatic changes. But if you do a Google search or an internet search on exponential change, your search will generate, I did this, I was actually very surprised because it generated thousands of articles on the topic. And the authors were journalists, consultants, and academics predominantly. Change is not new, but what is new is the technologically driven change that we're experiencing today and some of the cultural change. The amount of information available to people doubles every two years. It's just absolutely incredible. Doubles every two years. That was certainly not true of the ancient world. In 2019, over four billion people were using the internet and that number continues to increase dramatically. The change that concerns me most, or that I need to be aware of, is the way that technology has driven social change, and how technology has affected the church. I'm reminded of a phone conversation this last year from a lady that I know so well, doesn't live in Linden, outside the state, none of you would know her. And her daughter was struggling with her identity, Christian family, And she told me that when she met with the counselor, the counselor was, I was surprised to hear, was very good. She said, if you could remove the influence of technology from your daughter, you would not be meeting with me today. Everything your daughter is going through is a result of her exposure to social media. And until you address social media and some of these things, I can't help you. And this lady, who's a good friend of mine, is a left-leaning Democrat who identifies as a Christian. And she is a believer, I believe. So you can imagine the shock. And she called me. And it gave me great pause, because that story is duplicated. It's rampant. It's rampant.
That's the sum of the social set change, as we would call it. I'm not sure that's necessarily the best title, but nonetheless, that's the title that's often used. But then there's how this change with technology has affected church, practice, piety. I'm always surprised at how many people I run into who are completely tempted to just stay home, watch online. And some people even say, Pastor, I listen to way more sermons than most of the people in your church because I listen to how, who knows how many, but it's all online. Totally from the comfort of their car, their home, whatever it might be. There has been a dramatic change, especially since COVID, in piety and church practice. And to be honest with you, there's been a great falling away. And yet, over and against all this, here we are confronted with this statement, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus never, never changes. God never changes, never has changed, never will change. Any change would be equated with imperfection because when you're perfect and you change, you're less than perfect. So, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and truth remains forever according to the psalmist. And therefore, since Jesus never changes and the truth never changes, the fundamentals of the Christian faith never change. Never change, regardless of whether we're in the first century or the 21st century. The fundamentals, the truth, never changes. And therefore, because that is true, the Christian ministry ultimately never changes. We might take advantage of technology, but the message never changes. And if it does change, then that's a problem. A very serious problem. And that's what's being addressed by the author of Hebrews this morning. He's reminding them that God has never changed. Jesus is the same yesterday and to ever. And therefore, those heroes of the faith in chapter 11, beginning with Abel, including Noah and Abraham and Rahab and Moses, and all the prophets, all these people believed in the same Jesus Christ even though the incarnation had not yet taken place. They were believing the same promise, the same word, the same truth, and Jesus has not changed, and the truth has not changed. And he's telling them that actually by going back to the types and shadows, you are denying the truth. You are denying Jesus Christ because the faith they had was in Jesus Christ, even though maybe they didn't have the same clarity prior to the incarnation that we have now. And therefore, it's even greater now for you to depart from the truth because, like the book of Hebrews begins, in the time past, in former times, God revealed himself through the prophets. He spoke through the prophets. But now he has spoken through the incarnation, God incarnate, who is the exact representation, the exact person of God in the glory and glo in brightness. And, he, and that's how the book starts. And therefore, that is the very revelation that you're denying. If there were consequences for not hearing God when he spoke from Mount Sinai on earth, how much greater the consequences when he's spoken from heaven to the incarnation. And there you have it. That's what frames this. That's our context here. Do not be carried away by various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace. When I read that, I'll reread it. What stands out to you? It's a question. I want you to give me an honest answer. Not obviously audible, but do not be carried away by, with various and strange doctrines, for it's good that the heart be established by grace. And what stands out to you might be different depending on when you're reading this. The thing that stands out to me because I use scripture to interpret scripture, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by truth. But that's not what he says. He says by grace. That's what stood out to me. As I read this, if I was gonna finish this, I probably would have not said grace, I would have said truth. And you know why I would have said that? Because of the armor of God. The Apostle Paul begins, the first thing is gird yourself up in the truth. But he doesn't say truth here. He says, gird yourself up in grace. But remember his audience, he's speaking to Jewish converts. 
Why grace? Why not be established by the truth? He's, and grace does not deny the truth. As I've already stated in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul's teaching about the armor of God. We gird ourselves up in the truth, but as you continue to work, yourself, work your way through the armor of God, you find out the armor of God is preoccupied with the gospel of grace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, which distinguishes the darts. Who's the object of faith? Jesus Christ, the gospel of peace, which protects your feet. And therefore, all the parts of the armor of God are somehow related to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the truth here is relative to the gospel. And therefore, being girded up in grace is the same thing as being girded up in the truth of the gospel. One kind, and these things actually complement each other. The fundamentals of the faith relative to Jesus Christ and salvation be girded up in these things, stand in these things, and don't embrace some kind of revisionist teaching. You know, we, and, and here's the whole thing with the gospel. The gospel's historical. It's the saving life death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And, and if you want to challenge me on that, I would refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the Apostle Paul says, this is the gospel. And he refers to Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection, and he says he appeared, and he starts to list all the people he appeared to, even 500 at one time. And Paul says, that's the gospel. And if you stand in that truth and stand in that gospel, then you'll persevere and you'll, 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 you'll prevail. But if you forfeit that, if you waver from that, well then, you've fallen. Well, we live in a time of historical revisionists. And regardless of the historical revisionists and their attempt to erase history, which is what they're trying to do, because if people are historically uninformed or historically ignorant, they're much easier to control. You can't erase history. It's objective. And you can't erase the truth. You can try. You can try to revise. And we should not be surprised then of all the historical revision and all the attacks, the attacks upon the gospel. It's nothing new. And we should expect that in our own age, it would be prolific. Look at verse 9. Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. Two words used here in the Greek. The first word is translated as variety, and this word is the same word that's used in the Septuagint to describe the coat that Jacob gave to his favorite child, Joseph. Now, when Joseph wore this coat of many colors, or whatever was the distinguishing feature of this coat, Joseph stood out among his brothers. And it was apparent to everyone who looked upon him that this was a very special garment. And this garment distinguished him, and this garment would have been somewhat sensational. It grabbed your attention whether it be the color, the design, whatever it was. And I'm fine with going with the color, the coat of many colors. It was vivid. It made a statement piece. Think of a peacock with the tail feathers, and all of a sudden, there's the show of color. There's the show. It, it, you know, it was kind of like a peacock walking around because nobody else had a coat like this. There was only one made. It was one of a kind. And it was designed for the favored child. But it was impactful. And this is what the author of Hebrews, is the point he's trying to make. These varied, sensational type teaching, it's going to appeal to your senses. It's going to appeal to your flesh. It's visually stimulating. It, it, it stimulates you. You're going to be attracted to this. Why are people so attracted to false doctrine? Why are they so attracted to, uh, you, you, regardless of the false doctrine, you think of the whole prosperity teaching. Why are people attracted to that? Because they like the idea that the Christian gospel 
is going to make give me my best life now as opposed to afflictions and hardship in the wilderness that we're attracted to the idea that if I believe and if, and if I, I can do something that God and I can somehow manipulate God I can get something from God or I can get him to bless me in such a way in a very tangible way a very concrete way in this age and therefore it, it received huge huge traction I remember as a kid you know, the old Pentecostal preachers, they would preach against this because it was coming out of Tulsa, Oklahoma with Kenneth Copeland and all these guys. And it was very isolated back in those days. And, and you know, now it's just completely taken over and it, it's, it's prolific and, and, and we export this stuff. And you go to third world countries and you run into it, even in places where there's great poverty. And it's worldwide. And, and this is just one example of a false teaching. And there's so many but there's an appeal. I remember many years ago, I was in a library, a, a seminary library, and I was doing some work, and I ran into a guy who was doing doctoral work, and he was, it, it was the area in systematic theology, and I was visiting with him, had lunch with him a couple times, and he said, you know, it's frustrating doing what I do because I want to make a name for myself. I want to distinguish myself, and Christian doctrine doesn't change. And there's been so many great theologians that have written us so extensively on what we believe, what the Bible teaches. How do you say anything new? How do you say anything new unless you're a heretic? And he's like, I'm thinking of changing careers. Because I, I want to do something fresh. I want to do something new. I want to do something novel. I want to go where no man has gone before. I want to make a name for myself in academia. And I don't know how to do that in systematic theology. And I walked away from that conversation. I said, wow, that was really enlightening. That was really enlightening. This man is struggling with I can't make a name for myself. I can't build the Tower of Babel the way I would like to within the context of systematic theology because the truth doesn't change. And so many brilliant minds have written so extensively and studied this for so long. What new can you say about it? And that doesn't appeal to the flesh. That doesn't appeal to the flesh. But come out with a new theology and the openness of God, or you name it. Oh, wow, this is great. Appeals to the flesh. Strange. So we go from these two Greek words. The first one had to do with variation, like Jacob's coat of many colors. The second one is strange. The, the idea behind that is alien, something that's foreign, something that's coming in. And foreign stuff we're often attracted to because it's novel, it's interesting, it's different. It's like the first time I tasted pomegranate juice. Oh, this is really good. Growing up in Montana, nobody drank pomegranate juice. It's like, what is a pomegranate? I didn't even know. I mean, the first time I saw a pomegranate in the grocery store, I was like, I gotta go check this out. I've been reading about it in the Bible for years. I mean, Ecclesiastes makes great symbolic use of pomegranates and I'm like what are what's this fruit here strange alien we love we love the eccentric we love the different especially our world today well we got to keep go we got to keep moving I'm reminded though before I move on because this is the situation, this is the context, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. You know, and this is the advantage we have as Reformed people of using Scripture to interpret Scripture here. What is the context with this? This is Jewish converts. These people were all Jews. They've converted to Christianity. They're being severely persecuted. It's Antioch, it's Rome, who knows where. Maybe Jerusalem. And therefore... The opposition is coming from Jews who have rejected the truth. And that's why I read what I read this morning from Acts, to remind you how relevant this was to these churches. 
And the Jews, who rege- they became jealous because what had happened was there were so many Greeks that were attracted to the stability of Judaism and the truth in the crazy world they lived in. And they were attracted to stability in terms of families and structure, the idea there's right and wrong. They were attracted to this. And all these Jews, or non-Jews, are attracted. And they were the ones who largely responded to the gospel. They were the ones who responded to the gospel. Yes, there were Jews who responded to the synagogue. But a lot of these non-Jews attached. They were the ones that were responding, and therefore the power brokers of the synagogue realized they just lost control of this whole community. And Jesus was viewed as a threat. And the gospel was viewed as a threat. In Galatians, who are the false teachers? It's the Judaizers who've come from Jerusalem. They've come from Jerusalem. They've come from Grand Rapids. They came from the Netherlands. These are the false teachers. I'm trying to contextualize this to help us this morning. The most, the brightest, the latest, the, the, you send your most intelligent young people to the Netherlands to get, to get educated. They come back and they teach in your schools and institutions in America. They were the ones who introduced the false teaching. But because they're relatives, because they're part, there are people, there was the inability and the unwillingness to confront what needed to be confronted. That's the context here. And these Judaizers were coming and they were saying, and they even affected Peter and Barnabas. Peter and Barnabas, of all people, saying, yes, you need to believe in Jesus, but it's not enough. You have to be circumcised. What kind of food you eat in terms of cleanliness, clean, unclean, those distinctions matter. Whatever it was, it was application of the old covenant. It was application of the Mosaic law relative to the doctrine of justification. And Paul says, let him be anathema. And he confronts not Peter in person and Barnabas in private saying, hey guys. Because it was a public sin, he confronts them publicly. And they repent. And they repent. And then he goes on and talks about the altar And he says, those who serve in the altar in Jerusalem have no access to the real altar where Jesus Christ is offered. They have no access to the altar that you come to by means of the word. Sometimes when you study the Bible, the most shocking thing is what's not said. You expect something to be there, and it's not there. This is one of those cases But before I get on to that, let me read here. It is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. See, the whole idea here, it's like Galatians in the sense that this food has value for you relative to your soul and your spiritual well-being. The food offered to sacrifice, sacrificial food. The sacrificial food. And the author of Hebrews is saying that sacrificial food has zero value. There's zero calories spiritually. It's completely empty. In fact, now it's actually a hurdle to you. And it's a hindrance. Because the food that you need and the altar that you need to come to has to do with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. One time, sufficient. And you come to this altar by faith. The ministry of the word. I think one of the things that's hit me that was the biggest surprise in my study of Hebrews has been this one thing. Nothing has really surprised me up to this point except this. Why does he not talk about the communion table here? Because what a great opportunity to compare altars. 
What a great opportunity for the author of Hebrews to talk about the altar and the temple versus the communion table. But not a word about the communion table. Instead, completely preoccupied with the ministry of the word. And here you see the priority, even though we believe that the table is a means of grace, the priority is always the word. The priority is always the word. And this author of Hebrews is so wise and so filled with the Holy Spirit that he knows if he takes them to the communion table right now, they're going to turn it into something it shouldn't be, just like the Roman Catholic Church did. He knows that if he introduces the communion table here, that they're going to be convinced by eating bread and wine their spiritual nourishment, apart from coming to that table by faith. I'm absolutely convinced that's why he doesn't address the table and he leaves it completely out of the picture because they're going to come to Jesus Christ by the ministry of the word and the gospel. And we're going to be really clear on that. And he leaves the communion table completely out of this. And he does the same thing when he talks about Melchizedek. And when Melchizedek comes and he meets Abraham, what does he feed Abraham? What does he offer Abraham? Bread and wine! Another perfect opportunity to talk about the communion table. But he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it because he knows his audience. He knows the Jews. He knows that they are such legalists in terms of their hearts. They love the law. Just tell me what I got to do. Just tell me, oh, we go from eating this food to this food. Oh, I can do that. With the same mentality, he's addressing the heart. He's addressing the mentality that this food is consumed by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And it has nothing to do ultimately with the physical. You could eat the physical and not be spiritually nourished. Now, we see this with Peter. In Acts chapter 10, Peter's on the roof and he's praying and he has this vision where the sheep comes down and there's all these clean and unclean animals and the Lord commands them, get up and eat. And he's hungry. And, the, and Peter's, Peter's like, I can just see him stick his chest out. Absolutely not. I have never eaten anything unclean in my whole life. There's pride in saying that. Nothing unclean has ever passed through these lips. Three times, three times, three times. Cornelius, the messengers come. Go to the Greeks. Go to the centurion's house and minister the gospel to people you have always viewed as unclean. And the reality, Peter missed the whole symbolism. The whole purpose of the distinction between clean and unclean is the fact that we are unclean spiritually. And we are not cleansed by offerings offered in Jerusalem at a temple we are cleansed by the one-time sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we are nourished by grace. Nourished by grace. And this grace is found in Jesus Christ. And it's found as you embrace the truth of what the scriptures say about Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done. It's by grace. Apart from Christ, no grace. Apart from faith, no grace. It's exclusive to Christ. You come humbly, recognizing you're a sinner, recognizing you are unclean in and of yourself, and you come to Christ seeking cleansing, nourishment, life, all that Christ offers. Faith. Well, I need to go and finish real quick here. Next week, I'm coming back to outside the camp. I'm just going to briefly comment it right now. I will cover that extensively, I promise you, because it's rich. Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, was not crucified in Jerusalem in the temple at the altar. He was taken outside the camp 
And the author of Hebrews makes a very important statement. He says, even the sacrifices offered in the temple, when those sacrifices have been offered, what is left was taken outside the camp to the right place of refuge, the place that was most despised, and it was burned there. And that's where Jesus Christ was sacrificed. And his whole point is this. His whole point is salvation is found in that which we most despise. You've got to go outside the camp. That's where Christ was sacrificed. The reproach of Christ, the offense of the cross, the offense of the gospel, absolutely repulsive to your flesh, absolutely repulsive to the Jews. you got to go to the most despised, unclean place, and that's where you find cleansing, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The very thing in your life most offensive to your flesh, the most offensive to your pride, that's where you have to run, you have to flee outside the camp, away from the temple, away from that heritage, away from all those practices. Go to the most despised place where you find Jesus Christ crucified, and there you'll find cleansing. You'll find forgiveness of sins, and you'll find renewal. Everything associated with everlasting life, the kingdom that you are receiving that cannot be shaken, it's eternal. It's all found in the one who is despised. Like Isaiah said, Isaiah spoke of this all the way back in chapter 53. Nothing new. Nothing new. So when you come to this table this morning, you can eat the bread and you can drink the wine. And if you do it unbelievingly, not only is it not spiritually beneficial, but you bring judgment on yourself. The worst thing you could do is come to this table confident in you. Confident in you. You come to this table recognizing I am a sinner in need of grace. And I run to Christ crucified. And my confidence is in Jesus Christ, his saving life, death, resurrection, ascension. And when you come to him, you are assured that in him you have all the benefits, all the benefits of his saving work, including his death. All the benefits. And in Christ, as you come here, there's actually a participation, a fellowship in the body and blood of Christ. It's spiritual, it's mystical, but nonetheless, it's what we confess in our confessions because it's taught in the scriptures. This is my body. Bread remains red, wine remains wine, but nonetheless. And therefore this morning, let us come and let us feast by faith. Let us be nourished, not with our mouths, but with faith. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you might Press upon us a love for Jesus Christ, an affection for Christ, that he might be exalted in our hearts, that we might be satisfied with him, that we might not run after that which is novel, that we might not run after a gospel that would promise us our best life now, that we'd not be attracted to the coat of many colors, the alien teaching. But Lord, may we be well established and continue in your grace. The armor of God continuing in the truth and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we grow in that grace. May we grow in the understanding of our salvation and the confidence that we have in Christ Jesus as our rock and our refuge, as God's salvation for sinners. 
Lord, help us to continue in this and to grow in this knowledge. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn with me in your hymnals to page 103E. O come, my soul, bless the Lord.
I begin this morning by fencing the table as we come to, uh, come to the table this morning. If you have this insert in the bulletin, then I would refer you to that. And I'm just going to quickly uh, reference this. If you've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as an infant or an adult, we would require that. If you've made public profession of faith in Christ alone is your salvation, in agreement with the articles of the Christian faith as outlined in the Apostles' Creed. Um, we're all for private confessions of faith, but in terms of ultimately accepting a confession, it needs to have been done where it's in the context of the church, before the people of God. And uh, I mention that because sometimes people come from home churches and they, they don't really have this figured out yet. And uh, I don't, we probably have no one like here, that, but just in case. It needs to be a public profession of faith in line with the Apostles' Creed. Number three, you're presently a member in good standing of a Protestant congregation that bears the marks of a true church. That is a church wherein governing elders ensure that the pure doctrine of the gospel is preached, the pure administration of the sacraments is, as instituted by Christ are maintained, and church discipline is exercised. If you profess faith in Jesus but are disconnected from his church because you have not yet been baptized or received as a member of a true church, or if you are unsure, please abstain from Holy Communion and speak with one of the ministers or an elder after the service or at your convenience. If you can say yes to these things, we strongly encourage you to join us at this table. It's for believing sinners. It's not a memorial where we come and just remember what Christ has done. We do remember what he's done. But it's a supper. Can you imagine a up a supper and having a table with no food? Wouldn't be much of a supper, would it? There's food. Physically, you receive bread and wine, but that's not where the action is. The action is spiritual. It's what's going on spiritually. As you receive the elements spiritually, Christ is nourishing you. He's strengthening your faith. He's sustaining you. And there's even a strengthening of your union with him. Can't explain it, but I believe it. Let us make use of our form on page 51. To all of you who have with godly sorrow confessed your sins and who have affirmed true faith in Christ, the promise of Jesus is sure. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise him up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. For the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. While remaining bread and wine, these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify that we do not doubt but joyfully believe that we receive in this meal, by the Spirit, through faith, Nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. For all who live in rebellion against God and unbelief, this holy food and drink bring you only further condemnation. If you do not yet confess Jesus Christ and seek to live under his gracious reign, we admonish you to abstain. But all who repent and believe are invited to the sacred meal, not because you are worthy in yourselves. I would emphasize that. Not because you are worthy in yourselves, but because you are clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. Do not allow the weakness of your faith or your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table. For it is given to us because of our weakness. I want to emphasize that. You need this because you're weak. It is given to us because of our weakness and because of our failures in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As the word has promised us God's favor, so also our Heavenly Father has added this confirmation of his unchangeable promise. So come, believing sinners, for the table is ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies, cleanse our minds and hearts by your word and spirit that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through the Holy Sacrament, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity, the body and blood of Christ, our Savior. We know that our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands, but is in heaven, where he, can, where he continues to intercede on our behalf. 
Through the sacrament, by your own word and spirit, may these common elements now be set apart from ordinary use and consecrated by you so that just as truly as we eat and drink these elements by which our bodily life is sustained, so truly we receive into our souls for our spiritual life the true body and true blood of Christ. We receive these gifts by faith, which is the hand and mouth of our souls. Amen. As we draw near to the table of our Lord, let us confess our Christian faith. Congregation, let us confess the Apostles' Creed as a summary of what we believe. I believe in God, the maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now go to our heavenly table and receive the gift of God for our souls. By the promise of God, this bread and wine are for us, the body and blood of Christ. Lift up our hearts. The bread which we break is a communion of the body of Christ. It proclaims Christ crucified.
Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete remission. That means forgiveness of your sins. The cup of blessing which we bless is a communion of the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe. I would emphasize believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete remission of all your sins. Totally sufficient. Come to Christ with confidence. Let us drink.
why do we always have a loaf up here when we serve communion? It's important. According to the scriptures, the same language used in the Greek text when that loaf is broken, same word for preaching, Christ crucified is proclaimed to you visibly. We don't have pictures of Jesus on the walls. We don't have icons. We don't have statues. We got a baptismal font. We got a communion table, bread and wine. That's what God has ordained in terms of images. Nothing else. Nothing else. The breaking of that loaf, visible proclamation, Christ crucified, sufficient for you. Sufficient for you. Are you content with that? Are you content with the manna? That was a big problem for the nation of Israel. They were not content with the manna. They wanted something else. Are you content with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you content with the heavenly manna? Let us pray. Father in heaven, help us this morning that we might recognize what we receive by faith, the infinite value, the tremendous blessing that is ours, that we would not long after something more sensational something that would be more stimulating to our senses, whether it be visual or otherwise. Lord, may we recognize by faith and make good use of what you have given to us as a means of grace, as this sacrament this morning, that we come here, not naked, but we come here having been informed and taught regarding the ministry of the word, the truth, that we might come to this table in faith, that we might in faith feast upon Christ crucified. My body is real food, my, my blood is real drink, that we might be nourished unto everlasting life and that we might experience and know the beginning of everlasting life even now as we live in the midst of the wilderness as strangers and aliens, as pilgrims, traveling to the better country and therefore, we ask that you might bless our souls within us, strengthen us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I messed up. I meant to marry that into my congregational prayer which I'm going to continue with at this time let us pray father in heaven as we come before you as children we recognize that in as children we are never dependent in and of ourselves we're in need of our father and we're in need of your care may you create within us a hallowing of your name may you instill your kingdom within us that the kingdom of heaven might reign in our hearts, that we might serve you as those who understand the great privilege of being in the vineyard, that you might give us this day our daily bread, sustain us. We think of our brother, Jeff Hemnes, who's been in the emergency room and who's dealing with such life-altering circumstances regarding his health. Such precarious. Lord, will you minister to not only Jeff, but his family. And those who care for him. There's others in our congregation, Lord, who have potentially terminal illnesses and great infirmity, afflictions. And some have very heavy hearts. Some continue to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and deal with just tremendous discouragement. Lord, may you provide for them. Forgive us of our debts, we pray, as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation. Help us that we would not be deceived by the spirit of the age, by the sin, by the evil one, by the lawless 
the mystery of lawlessness. May we not be swept away by this, we pray. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. The offering this morning, I believe, is for the general fund. God bless you as you worship in the giving of your tithes and offerings. I invite you to stand to receive the blessing of our Lord. I remind you of this blessing. It's not a prayer in this context. It's a declaration to you. It's a pronouncement to you to be received in faith. Now may the God of peace, who brought our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Make you complete in every good work to do his will. Working in you was pleasing in God's sight. Amen.